Hi there. Welcome to Models of Online Instruction. My name is Stephanie Richter. I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. And I have some contact information for you there on screen. I'll put this up again at the end so you can get my contact information then as well. Today, we're going to talk about online teaching, but really about online course design, how you plan and um, create and think about your online course. So I hope after today that you'll have an idea of how to um, identify, select, and utilize a variety of different models and structures for your online course. And that you can identify the technology that you would need to support that model when you're teaching online. None of these uh, models that I'm going to prepare are really um, any different from what you would do in the face-to-face -face classroom. So ultimately, this is just the assurance that you can use these same techniques in the online classroom. When we do teach face-to-face, -face, we all utilize a wide variety of teaching techniques. Uh, we might have a course that's very hands-on, uh, like a lab component, um, or a, a clinical or a studio. We might rely a lot on collaborative work, where students work together in order to solve problems or to create new work. Um, we may use a lot of um, lecture is a valid technique to distribute content to students particularly uh, if you engage them throughout the process where students are asking questions or responding to questions and actively thinking about the content during that class session. And then we also use a lot of discussion techniques where instead of the instructor taking center stage, we allow the students, encourage the students, require the students to come forward and lead some of that discussion themselves by becoming an expert on a topic and then sharing that with, their stu with the other students in the course. Um, this variety of technique is really quite a positive thing. It's good for our students. It's good for uh, ourselves to have a variety of tools that we can pull out at any time to use in our courses and has really developed over the, the history of teaching from millennia of working with transferring knowledge and, and encouraging growth and learning in students. When you teach, I want to take just a moment to pause and reflect. What are your favorite teaching techniques? What do you like to use? What are you comfortable using? And also, what of your teaching techniques has the strongest impact on your students? Not what do they like the most, but when do you see those lights come on? Uh, feel free to share some in the text chat, or if anyone wants to use your microphone, uh, raise your hand use with the hand button, and I'll turn the microphone over to you. But I really like to have you share some of your favorite, uh, favorite teaching techniques or strategies. Pat, PBL, problem-based learning. Yes, that's a favorite of mine, too. And we will talk about problem-based learning today, actually. That's one of our topics. Just to mean, OK, same here. Excellent. Yes, problem-based learning, I think, is one of the most powerful techniques you can use. Or um, sometimes it's referred to in a slightly different variety as inquiry-based learning. Uh, they're not quite exactly the same, but they're similar. Um, how about, do any of you use a lot of discussion with students, of having students, either student-led discussion or instructor-led discussion? Uh, but having the students really engage in a conversation in the classroom. You can give me a yes in the text chat or give me a green check mark again to say yes. So I've got quite a few check marks. I've got three of you with check marks. Um, and just means yes, some discussion, but mostly instructor led. Definitely. Excellent. Any other standout techniques before I move on um, that you want to share, something that you've had a lot of success with in your classroom? Well, I don't see any activity in the, the text chat, so 
um, thank you for sharing your, your experience with your current teaching. Um, and hopefully you see how those threads weave into some of the models we'll talk about today. When people think about instruct, or, excuse me, when people think about online teaching, I think most of us have a very specific notion of what an online course is. That might come from your experience as an online student. It might come from talking with colleagues or from um, working with other institutions or publishers who have very specific set structures for online courses. Here at NIU, just like with our face-to-face -face courses, we encourage you to um, create a model for your online course that's as flexible as you need it to be, and that really fits the needs of you, your content, and your students. So today, we're going to talk about some of those uh, specific structures that are classically, traditionally used, as well as some additional models and frameworks you might want to consider. And I'm going to start with the classic models, those, those models that we expect for an online course. <clears throat> the first one is kind of a classic asynchronous model. And to be honest, you probably see this in your face-to-face -face courses too at times. Even though you're coming together for a class, it's not quite asynchronous. Uh, generally, an asynchronous model starts with uh, some sort of an assigned reading for students, and then a content delivery mechanism, probably a lecture or a tutorial for them to go through. Then students engage in discussion with one another and complete an assessment. This is kind of a classic four-step online course design model. Generally, by calling this asynchronous, we mean that students are not all coming together at the same time to talk the way that they would in a face-to-face -face classroom. You don't have time with all of the students together, and the students don't have time with one another. Generally, asynchronous online courses are still, um, they're, they're still run in, in sort of lockstep parallel scheduling, where all of the students are completing the course at the same rate. But asynchronous online courses can also be delivered at a self-paced schedule, where perhaps all the students start at the same time, but some can work quicker, some can work slower, and they can complete the course by the end date, uh, but following their own path. That's not as common, and it's definitely not very common here at NIU, but is sort of the asynchronous model taken to an extreme. When you look at these, at this as a model, the readings uh, can come from a variety of sources. Online, um, you can still have a textbook, which I think is sometimes a, a misconception that faculty have. You can have a textbook. Students can order it to be shipped from the bookstore. If they aren't here on campus, they can order it online from Amazon or a host of other online bookseller sources. But a print-based textbook is a valid, perfectly valid resource in an online course. You may choose to incorporate a lot of e-readings, however, uh, in a face-to-face -face or online course, for that matter, so that students can access those reading materials from the course shell, the site on Blackboard, instead of in a print-based form. You may also incorporate in those e-readings, then, non-traditional text sources for a course. Uh, you might utilize uh, journal articles or newspaper articles outside of the textbook. You might use um, a blog, for example, or uh, a news source that's maybe a little bit more digital and not traditional. For content delivery in an online course, uh, a lot of that takes the form asynchronously as tutorials, where you've recorded a, a PowerPoint lecture with maybe some audio narration, uh, just like you would in a face-to-face -face course. You can record that same content and deliver it to students online. You may create a screencast, particularly if you utilize a lot of software in your courses. You can record yourself utilizing and explaining the, so the software just like you would demonstrate it in class, and then share that so that students can watch it online. And then video is a, a very useful source as well uh, for creating content. And the videos could be 
video that you find online. Uh, there are a lot of resources available. It might be a video that you create because, again, there are a lot of inexpensive and easy to use uh, video creation tools as well. In an asynchronous model, uh, most of the discussion is going to occur via discussion board where students have um, uh, threaded discussions. One starts a post and the others then reply to it. They can log in today to create their initial post. They can log in tomorrow to view any replies and continue the discussion. But you could also use something like a blog where it's a similar concept where students make a post and then others comment, but the blog is more time bound. So the most recent response is always at the top and it's more of an individual ownership where a discussion board is a post to starting a discussion, starting a conversation. A blog is more, a blog entry is more of a, a starting point for additional comments and you don't get necessarily as much conversation uh, or it's not designed for as much conversation. But they can be used uh, somewhat interchangeably. And then for assessments, you might give a, a test online where students complete uh, multiple choice or open-ended essay or short answer exam. And you can also um, assign other types of assignments, such as research papers or um, presentations are difficult asynchronously uh, since students aren't all together to watch them. But students could record a presentation and share that asynchronously as well. The flip side, the other classic online teaching model then, is a synchronous course. In a synchronous session or a synchronous based course, the students frequently come together uh, themselves and together with you to meet and uh, basically have a class session like you would have face to face. In this model, the readings and the assessment don't really change from the asynchronous model, but that live virtual session would occur via some form of web conferencing tool like Blackboard Collaborate that we're using right now or Adobe Connect. There are a variety of other tools out there as well. And in those live sessions then, instead of recording content for students to watch, you can deliver content live like I'm doing here. You can incorporate active discussion activities like the polling questions that I've asked or uh, open-ended responses where students can use a microphone to respond to questions and share stories. I've also seen these live virtual sessions used for um, very discussion heavy courses where there is no content to present. The content is covered in the readings, but the synchronous session is a time for question and answer and uh, student discussion. Or even for holding more formal events like debates uh, where students come in and present an argument via audio and then um, reply and rebut against one another. So here, this live virtual session takes the place of both content and discussion that we had on the asynchronous form. These, though, I want to point out are only two models and they, they are not discrete either. So let me change the poll here. We'll start now and ask, of those two classic models, which one do you prefer? There's no right or wrong answer. Do you prefer, do you think, to teach a, an asynchronous online course, a synchronous course, or a combination of them? And you can use, I changed the check mark to an ABC, op, the ABC option. So you can go back to that same location where the check mark was and now choose your response. Feel free to elaborate in the text chat if you'd like. I'll give everyone a moment to be able to go in and respond. Well, here's the breakdown. I can pull these out. Here's the breakdown for you of your, um, your responses. So it looks like right now you're a bit split, although most of you prefer either asynchronous or a combination of asynchronous and synchronous. 
Mandy, yes, you chose synchronous, you say, because for language courses, interaction is essential. And I definitely think with a technology like this one, uh, if I were teaching a foreign language course, this lets me use my voice in a more powerful way and lets my students use their voices back, which is, uh, would be missing, I think, from an asynchronous online language course. Although there are models where it's done that way via more asynchronous technology where students interact with you maybe, but not with each other. So it's possible, but I, I would tend to agree that at least a combination, if not a synchronous uh, model would be better. And this is what I mean by when you consider the design of your online course, thinking about your content, thinking about your field, and thinking about your learning objectives. What do you want students to come away with? And how does that define the choices you make? So these are only the first two models that we're going to talk about. But you can think about the rest of what we cover, excuse me, the rest of what we cover in terms of whether it would be synchronous or asynchronous and how you would weave those together. The, the other models I'm going to share, I kind of lump together into this concept of active learning models. And it's not to say that asynchronous or synchronous models were not active to begin with, um, because they, they certainly can be. But these, these further models are really designed for um, requiring, actually, requiring active learning. There's no way for most of these to be a passive learner if the course is designed in these ways. Pat asks a great question. Would the size of the class dictate the model? It certainly can. Um, but I've had successful uh, synchronous sessions with 15, with 45. Um, they're about as active at, you know, 60 to 70 as you would have in a 60 to 70 student classroom. Um, I think particularly for synchronous with a larger class, um, the text chat in here could even take on a life of its own where students are engaging with one another while I'm maybe uh, doing something different. And then I can also break them into breakout rooms within here to have smaller group collaboration to come back to the whole group. So uh, with large classes, I think we tend toward asynchronous because it's easier to manage large groups that way. But I don't think that that's the only factor that you would use in choosing one of these models. It certainly is a factor, however. So the first active learning model that I want to talk about is collaborative learning. You may also hear about this as team-based learning. So if we're, we're going to pull out all of our acronyms, we've already talked about PBL. This would be TBL, I guess, uh, collaborative learning, uh, where the course really starts turning around the content. And here I've kind of lumped together the idea of readings or uh, lectures, tutorials as content um, together. But you would certainly have multiple sources of content that combine with um, a, an authentic and challenging and engaging group activity. And I don't necessarily like the word groups. I usually use teams over groups. I think that um, a group is just a collection <laughs> that's close to each other, whereas a team is a bit more unified with a, a common purpose and more responsibility to that collective entity. So I tend to use team uh, over group even. But there is some sort of a team group collaborative task that the students engage with. And I think it's also really important in a collaborative model that then the students come back and they share what they've done individually in their groups, teams, et cetera, with the rest of the class. So here, for example, you might have initially a core group of, a core uh, set of content that all of the students learn together. And then uh, you can do what's called a jigsaw, where students go off in their collaborative teams to master specific aspects of the content and then come back and teach one another. That's one collaborative model. 
or you might have a task that all of the students do in their teams, but that they do with um, on different, again, different topics or different areas. I'll talk some later. I'll show you what my class looks like using these models. I just taught an online course this semester. And I had a set, a core group of content that everyone had to learn, but then the course really revolved around a project that they worked on in teams. So while everyone was using the same framework and using the same content, they all had different settings and different problems that they were working on in their, their group work. Here, I think some of the the key technologies that you need to incorporate really have to do around the group work because students don't always collaborate well face to face. Uh, there are some challenges and barriers for that that students face, such as uh, schedules, time commitment, uh, really knowing how to work collaboratively, which is a skill in and of itself. Uh, in the online environment where students aren't meeting face to face, they don't see each other, it can actually become more challenging, but it's not impossible. It can be done quite effectively. Uh, here, what I would recommend is offering a variety of different technologies that the students can use with their teams in order to collaborate. For example, teams might use a blog in order to share uh, resources that they found with one another and build a community. You might have the team work on creating a wiki where they're collaboratively authoring content that they can share with the other students as a resource. Uh, web conferencing is certainly a fantastic tool for uh, building collaboration and community among different people. And then of course discussion boards. So you might provide asynchronous technology for students to use in order to collaborate with their team. And this is just a small fraction of what's available. Uh, when my teams worked together for my class this semester, I enabled these tools for them so that they had them as an option. But then they went off and used a variety of other things as well. I had students who were meeting via Skype. They held um, created documents in Google where they could all collaborate on a single document. Uh, they called each other on the phone and text messaged each other. I wouldn't limit them. I didn't limit them to these tools, but I gave them the seeds to start and then encouraged them to find the pathways that they could use to work together as well. The second model I want to cover is case-based learning. And case-based learning is very common already in pockets around the university. So for example, in the law school, nearly all of the, the teaching done in the law school is done via case study, where they look at a particular court case or a particular dilemma and then go out and find the resources that they need in order to solve that case. So in a typical case-based model, there's some content initially provided. So the students learn something through reading, through lecture, uh, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, about the principles and theories that they need to know. Then you present them with a case study. And a case study is a rich description of a particular context or problem. So students use the information that you provide in that case study to go back to the principles and theories and come up with either a solution, if you've asked them to solve the problem in the case study, what should these people do, or to evaluate the case study. Uh, sometimes cases are situations that either went really well or went really poorly, and then you ask students to uh, really tell you why that happened. So if uh, the case study is a, an example of a project that failed, you might ask students to identify, based on those principles, what did, um, what did they do wrong? Or how did they, what could they have done with the theory we've discussed in order to get a better solution? Those student responses can take a variety of formats. Uh, for a low stakes case study, you might have students respond on the discussion board uh, where they can post their response and then continue to discuss with one another. 
you might have students write it as a, um, a paper. Maybe it's a, depending on the complexity of the situation, it might be anywhere from you know, a very short paper to a very long, intricate uh, response. You can have students respond via presentation, particularly if you're using um, synchronous technology like this. I do think it's important that you include at least through that student response, but I think that adding the component of having students discuss the solution with one another adds another layer of uh, complexity and of, of efficacy where students aren't just focused on their own solutions, but they can also gain from the, the collaborative environment. When you're using uh, case-based learning, you can, of course, do it for a small piece of a course or for an entire course, where instead of having students work on other types of assignments maybe or learning activities, all that they need to do is respond to a series of case studies that progressively walk them through the content. Here, uh, I think one of the interesting ways to use technology for an online course when you're using case studies is with how you actually introduce the case studies themselves. Classically, case studies are text-based. So it's a written description with all of the details that the students need in order to continue on the, uh, with their analysis. However, in an online course, you could present the case study via video either a video of yourself or a video of the, uh, the environment in order to provide those details. Um, you can also do a lot with guest speakers for case studies. If you have a, an organization that you want students to analyze and respond based on the course content, you could get a representative of that group to come in and share their story. They could do that via text or video. They could do it via web conferencing like this. Um, there are a variety of options. But having that come directly from the source is an interesting, um, an interesting model, a, a possibility for how you would introduce that case study. I also think if you take this a step further, there's a lot to be said about um, simulation as a case study. So classically, case studies are usually this, here's the situation, write a response. Um, but given the increasing technology, you can actually provide case studies via simulation where students are in an immersive environment and they have to uh, maybe gather some of that information themselves from the environment. And they might be able to take their analysis create a solution in the simulation and see how it plays out instead of just writing a response for you to grade. Um, so think, you can think bigger. And there are, of course, resources on campus, such as eLearning Services, who could build a, a simulation environment for you that's much richer than students reading a text-based case study and then writing a response. That doesn't make it inherently better but it does uh, change the dynamic a bit of the, the learning that's going on. We already talked about, since um, Pat and Jessamine brought up problem-based learning. This is a favorite of mine as well. In problem-based learning, it's similar to case studies, but you flip the dynamic a little bit, where students start with a problem. And generally, this is a problem that you as the faculty would introduce. Um, in some cases, these are problems that students identify themselves. Once they have that problem, then they find the content that they need in order to solve it. Um, for example, um, in the, the example in my course, I use a bit of problem-based learning where the students had to conduct an evaluation of uh, something in their environment. They were mostly teachers. So it was program evaluation. They had to f pick a program or an initiative in their schools and devise an evaluation plan in order to evaluate that. Um, it was a little bit of a, a problem-based scenario because they were 
learning about evaluation design as they progress through solving their problem. I didn't start with six weeks of learning about evaluation and then let them start working on their problem. We wove them together. I also gave them general information myself about evaluation, but they had to also find resources themselves that were specific to their situations. So if they were in a school that was doing a one-to-one -one initiative where every student got an iPad, I didn't have any information for them about those initiatives. They had to go and gather additional resources about such an initiative uh, on their own. So it, was a, it wasn't a pure problem-based scenario that I used, but it was uh, kind of a balance, a mix of the two. And I say that sometimes in a problem-based situation, you pose the problem, but in other cases, it can be quite effective to have students identify problems themselves. Uh, this could be an interesting uh, for, uh, probably for a capstone course, but it would be an interesting exercise in the first week to have students brainstorm what problems are they aware of in the field that they would like to try to tackle and then come to a consensus as a group under your direction for what problem or problems you're going to address as a class. Anything that you can do to put more of the power into the student's hands, particularly at an upper level or graduate level, uh, really increases the amount of learning that the students will gain from it and their commitment and engagement to the content. In problem-based learning, I think the, the key aspect is the either resources that you provide or the resources that students find. And you may need to provide some yourself to kind of get them started. But these can be text documents, they could be books, they can be videos, websites, tutorials. Um, there's just a wealth of resources out there. You might even provide ways for students to get in contact with other experts, um, particularly in the age of social media. If you had a few colleagues who were ready and willing to lend their expertise via um, Twitter or Skype interviews or um, other online social means, you really start engaging more of the, the digital aspects of what students are uh, capable of. And again, you broaden the net from you as expert to students as detectives. Either way, what's really important about problem-based learning is that equal sign. <laughs> it's a problem plus resources, but the equal is a student-directed process. It can be individual or collaborative, but solving that problem is where students utilize all of their content knowledge, research skills, critical thinking, and analytic abilities in order to actually create and synthesize a solution that didn't exist before. Uh, the best problem-based uh, problems are big, open-ended, uh, what we would call an ill-structured problem, where there's not a clear solution. If there's a clear solution, it's a good problem-based um, opportunity, but it's not an exceptional, a really excellent one. So it's students tend to learn more from those, those big sticky problems as long as there's enough support or uh, help for them to find the resources that they need. And then uh, one of my other favorite models is experiential learning. And experiential learning is uh, really a big umbrella topic. Uh, there's no way to, for me, to really define what experiential means in a small scale. But it's, it involves some sort of a real world experience where students go and do something. Uh, this could be a big real world experience. Things like internships and practicums, um, clinicals are real world experiences. And they have courses of their own. In a typical online course though, when students aren't coming together in the classroom, they still have a real world out around them where they can go and have experiences. For example, um, we put together a, a massive open online course, a MOOC, a year ago with Greg Long here at NIU. 
and the course was on perspectives on disability. So we were building a course expecting or anticipating at least trying to create capacity for thousands of students and we couldn't create individualized experiences for everyone. But one of our assignments asked them to go out and find any building in their community and use a checklist to rate its accessibility. That was a real world experience where students went out into the world, saw something around them, uh, and, and analyzed it and did the learning on their own. Then we asked them to come back and reflect. And based on that reflection, uh, come to some conclusions about the experience, what they had learned, and discuss that learning with one another. Particularly in online courses, I think incorporating those types of real world experiences where it can be a big experience like an internship or a small experience like going to a community building, finding a community partner, um, or going and observing um, people in a certain space can really be a, a powerful way to bring the learning back to reality for them. Online courses, I think, have a tendency to seem canned, to seem sort of stale, where it's a set body of knowledge that I just read and listen and write. So incorporating those actual experiences uh, are, is far more powerful. And I used all the different colors here to reflect the fact that these could be big experiences or small experiences. They might be doing, observing, practicing, interviewing. There are a variety of different tasks. There's no one experience that they should be going through. The two pieces here that are actually online are the reflection and the discussion. Again, that reflection could be individualized with you. It could be private where students reflect themselves and then submit that to you as an assignment or maybe a journal entry. They could reflect in the written word or they could record a video where they talk about what they've gained from the experience. And they could do it a little bit more informally with a blog, either in the learning management system or public. And then they can discuss, again, with each other, with um, either synchronously or asynchronously through something like web conferencing or through a discussion board. I also want to pause here, as long as we're talking about real world experience, to talk about other ways to bring the real world into the online classroom. Because quite often we hold these courses in walled gardens where only the students in the course have access to the materials or um, each other. And I think that in certain circumstances, there's also a powerful case, not only for sending the students out into the real world to go and, and do something, but to have them do it and share what they've done or learned with the world as well. So for example, if you have students record a video, you might ask, you could require, but I think asking is a little bit nicer for students at first for them to share that publicly. Maybe they post it on YouTube where others can see their, um, their story about what they've learned out in the real world. Or if you're asking them to blog, they can blog privately in the course where only their classmates can see it. But I think students change the way that they write and what they say if they're writing for a more public audience. So I do encourage you as well when you're thinking about your online course, about whether that course is going to stay within the, it's not four walls online, but within the walls of the, the, the closed system, or if it's more appropriate, if there's something to be gained by opening that up outside of that environment. It's much easier to do that with an online course than it is to do with your face-to-face -face course, where there literally are four walls closing you in. The key piece, though, when you think about these models is they're not new. We've done them in face-to-face -face courses for years. I'm mostly just assuring you that the technology is there to support you utilizing these same techniques in an online course. You can use one on its own. I've seen very successful courses that are entirely case-based, for example or entirely collaborative, entirely problem-based, entirely experiential. But 
uh, that can be a lot of work for you to design and set up. And it's a lot of work for students to engage in an entire course of experience-based learning, for example. So mix and match. You can do a week of synchronous, a week of asynchronous, leave them two weeks to work in a collaborative project, come back synchronously, move back to an asynchronous model again, give them an experiential project that they do on their own, and come back synchronously to share. So these aren't discrete models you have to use on their own. I encourage you to mix and match. So here's the story of my online course. It was ETR 531. It's Program Evaluation and Education. And I taught it entirely online. So for my online course, the content came from the textbook, which uh, they all had copies of, came from the, uh, some resources, additional videos, and web links that I posted online, and some videos that I created. We also met synchronously periodically throughout the semester, where I gave what I called mini lectures. They were usually 15 minutes long. I didn't spend too much time pouring content at them. We sort of, in those synchronous sessions, spent some time listening to me. I encouraged them to talk. Uh, I had specific discussion questions for them. And I had them share their projects as well. So our content was a mix of synchronous and asynchronous within this overall collaborative framework that I built the course around. Uh, the course was built on a collaborative model where students had that project that I wove throughout the entire course. So what I'm saying is it was a, my, my approach as far as these models was a collaborative course where the content was somewhat asynchronous, somewhat synchronous week by week as schedules and as the content dictated. The group work, the teamwork then, was a combination of problem-based learning and experiential learning. They had a project, they had a problem that they had to identify something in their schools that needed to be evaluated. And then once they had identified that problem, they utilized the content that I had provided as well as finding additional resources and additional uh, experts who could serve as resources for them in order to approach the evaluation of their problem specifically. And because I really wanted this to tie back to their profession uh, and what they were, their career goals, I had them pick something that was a real life problem in their schools. So it was somewhat experiential for them because they were actually doing the evaluation plan and they were doing it for something that they were actually engaging with in their schools. Many of them, in fact, shared their projects back with their administration. Uh, and got some very positive results from that, too. And then the sharing, again, was both synchronous and asynchronous. I had them post to discussion boards. They had five discussion board assignments throughout the course where they actually just posted a response and then replied to one another. But then I also had them engage in discussions during our synchronous sessions and had them share what they had learned so far with their project in that form as well. So this is the picture of my course. And I struggled to know how I really wanted to build this. I, built, I decided to build this out as a collaborative course with synchronous and asynchronous components. And the collaborative teamwork was going to be an experiential problem-based project. I could have also decided that I would frame this as a uh, a, a problem-based course with an experiential component and the content and um, sharing being synchronous and asynchronous. But I wanted to emphasize the collaborative model more. Are there any questions about the way that I did that? Or do you want to hear more about specific specifics around that? I don't see anyone <laughs> responding, so I'll assume I did a great job explaining it. <laughs> think about your own courses in this way, too. I think it helps to break down and think about what, if I'm designing an online course, what am I doing this week? 
this week, are we collaborative, are we experiential, is this an asynchronous week or a synchronous week? And that can help you see how all of the pieces come together in your own courses. So now, let me give you the right polling type. Choose A, B, C, D, or E. Which model here do you prefer of those that I've discussed? Or is there some other model that you prefer more, either a combination of them or um, something I didn't introduce today that you're, you've used in the past? Give me, uh, with the drop down, an A, B, C, or D. If you choose E, then give me what your other choice was in the text chat. So I'll give you a few seconds here to respond. There are a couple of you who, I don't know if you're not hearing me now or um, if you don't have a favorite, that's okay too. <laughs> so it looks like everyone's opting for combo, which is great. <laughs> um, Pat just said combo. Isabel says, how about a mix? Combination, Mandy specifically, A, C, and D. I like that. Um, yes, it definitely keeps things interesting more to change up your approach, um, and it can address le different learning preferences, where some students prefer to read, some will want to watch a video, some will want to dig in and do something, um, but the research has shown that for any student, regardless of what they prefer, combining different modalities is more effective than any single one. So that's great. So I want to highlight just a few trendy techniques. Um, not necessarily something to build an entire credit course around, but something to consider when you're designing your online course. Uh, one of those is mobile learning. There's been a strong emphasis in the past several years for creating materials that are mobile friendly. We all have our devices. I, in fact, have two right here on my desk um, that we use quite often, and in fact, I turn to these more often than I do to my laptop when I'm at home. And so do our students. So when you can, I encourage you to think about how your online course is going to work with mobile devices. Do you have content or uh, media in your course that's mobile friendly? Have you, do you have opportunities maybe to incorporate mobile activities, particularly with experiential learning? If you have students go out with a mobile device into the community and record, whether that's recording a video or taking photos of something that fits into the course, um, I think that's very powerful. As well as using them for on-site observations or taking notes for those problem-based and experiential learning projects. There are courses that have been built entirely mobile compatible. Um, I think that limits your assessment and activity choices a little bit too much still uh, for my preference, but that's just my preference and there are courses where that would be perfectly feasible and valid. The other one has been, it's a little bit on the downswing. It was most popular, it was really popular in 2012, but we're, we're kind of leveling off now is MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. These courses are free for anyone to take open to anyone in the world and can be very large from a few hundred to multiple thousands of people enrolled in these courses. They generally have little instructor to student interaction directly, uh, usually done via emails or discussion board where it's the instructor contacting many students. And the assessments are usually automated or peer uh, evaluated. MOOCs are a very different type of course design from a traditional online course. But because these courses are out there, they're available, they're free, you can actually look to those courses to pull in some resources for your more traditional online courses. So keep that in mind, uh, particularly um, Pat, I think, had asked about how course size dictates your, your choices. And it's different to think about 
you know, a few tens of students versus hundreds of students versus thousands of students. And that definitely is a factor in how you design your course. So technology, oh, sorry, Pat, how successful are they in general? Um, MOOCs are difficult to evaluate success on. In fact, that's something that's still being considered is what what makes a MOOC successful? Is it the number of students who enroll? The number of students who finish? Is it the engagement of the students who have enrolled and or finished? Um, they're still going strong, particularly the, um, the more corporate providers like uh, Udacity has changed its focus but still exists, Coursera, edX, which is a consortium of universities, um, have been fairly active still. But it's interesting to see how that's evolved as a construct and where it'll go in the future. Online courses, more traditionally, however, are just gaining, uh, I think, there, there's no downtick in the number of online courses or online degrees coming anytime soon. So I talked briefly about technology for each of the models, but I want to cover some specific terms, specific names of technology to help you know where to go with some of these. So for delivering content, we talked about ways to do it asynchronously through tutorials or screencasts or video. Uh, this slide here has some specific products that you might use. Uh, and I've highlighted, I've asterisked, starred the ones that we offer training on uh, here in faculty development. So if you wanted to create a, almost a lecture, you could do that with Adobe Presenter, uh, which we provide training on. There are a lot of other products out there. It's not the only one. For screencasts, we recommend Camtasia, which can actually record your screen plus your audio. Um, Jing is a free version that can record short five-minute videos. If you're recording video directly with a, a video camera or with your, your phone's camera, you can edit that in, again, a variety of products. iMovie and Windows Movie Maker are both free, depending on whether you're a Mac or PC person. If you're a pro with video, Final Cut Pro is fantastic, uh, but it's a little complex to learn. You can also um, deliver content synchronously via web conferencing with Blackboard Collaborate or Adobe Connect. Here, uh, faculty development offers training on Blackboard Collaborate, and eLearning Services offers free training on Adobe Connect, both of which are available at NIU. Mandy, is Camtasia available through NIU or any of our labs? Uh, not centrally that I'm aware of. We offer Camtasia in a lab that we maintain. So if you needed to come in, we actually allow you to reserve that lab, basically schedule time for you to come in and use Camtasia in our lab. Because there is a fee to purchase the software. Um, so instead of you purchasing it or your department having to purchase it, you can come use it here in our lab. So you can reach out to me and I'll put you in contact with who you would need to contact for that. For communication tools, um, asynchronously, a variety of tools inside and outside of Blackboard. If you haven't tried text messaging, I recommend a tool called Remind 101, although I think they've changed just remind.com now. It's a great tool for you to be able to text message to your students without them text messaging back to you. Uh, but it's a convenient way to send out short announcement bursts. For synchronous, you can always use the phone to communicate to a single student. Uh, also, consider other tools that you or they might use. A lot of our students have used Skype for calling home, particularly our international students. Uh, Google Voice and Google Hangouts are also great tools for uh, communicating, not necessarily with a whole class at a time, for like delivering a lecture or having a discussion, but for you to meet individually with students. For students to collaborate, there are a few tools in Blackboard, both blogs, wikis, um, are great tools for students collaborating asynchronously. For synchronous communication, Google Docs at Google Drive now actually allows students to type together at the same time on a document, or uh, one student can 
show their screen in a tool like Blackboard Collaborate for them to collaboratively write here. And as a reminder, all of our students have access to Google Drive through their ZID. And then assessment uh, generally is asynchronous um, in an online course, although you can do live presentations via web conferencing. That would be a more synchronous assessment. Or for Mandy and our other language learning folks, you could do um, oral skills and auditory skills through um, web conferencing or other communication tools as well. So I just want to summarize that online courses don't have to be the static uh, traditional view that most people have of online courses. They can use the same instructional models that you use face to face and be just as active and engaging. The, the technology that you use, the techniques you use, really should be balanced and so that they align with and match the learning objectives that you have, the resources and skill that knowledge that your students have, and the research resources, skill, and comfort that you have with both those techniques and the technology. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the text chat now or to contact me after the event. I'm happy to field those questions. And I've put my contact information here on the slide. Thank you guys so much.